It's happening. It's happening. All right. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Olympia chapter meeting for Oystober. Heck yeah. Happy almost end of seafood month, official Washington seafood month. Um, we're going to wait another minute or so to just let the last of the public trickle on in. Um, but we do have a short icebreaker because we always love to hear meet you guys and, and hear your stories. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and pull that up. Make sure I share the thing that I want to share. Hold on. I don't have I don't have my things together. Ah. Gus, your hair hair and beard is amazing. I haven't seen you for a long time. <laughs> Gus. That's it's awesome. awesome. It's been a couple months since we've zoomed with You are that. ready for Clean winter. Water. <laughs> I've been working on this Halloween costume for like seven months now, so thank you. I really appreciate that. I feel unprepared right now. As I said on one of my calls earlier today, I'm like resisting the constant barrage from the wife every day to shave and get a haircut. So just keep it on, keep Great. it on, you know? Let it go. <laughs> fight the good fight. Yeah, I support you. Uh, all right. I'm going to share my screen. Boom. All right. All right, does everybody, can everybody see that? Welcome to our chapter meeting. All right. So, um, yeah, welcome to Olympia's chapter meeting. Thank you for taking time to spend uh, your evening in front of a screen. I know it's not ideal, but hopefully we'll make it through this virtual, virtual time together and uh, hang out in real life again one day. Um, so we do love to go through and, and meet everybody and we do a typical icebreaker. Um, and so for this meeting's icebreaker, we want to hear your name, um, if you've voted yet or not, and what costume you would wear if you were to participate in our solo costume cleanup contest that is from now through November 1st. And so you have until Sunday night to submit your photos. More on that later. Um, so I will go first. Does somebody who has access, because I'm sharing my screen right now, want to be in charge of um, naming names and calling people out so we don't leave anybody out? Because I can't see everybody right now. I can call them out. I'll go across awesome. the Jill, take it away. Call some people out. Are you going first? I can go first. All right. So my name is Liz Scottman. I am the Washington Regional Manager for Surfrider Foundation, one of two staff in the state. Um, I recently voted a few days ago um, and filled out my ballots and turned them in at a Dropbox and felt real good about it. Um, and this is actually my husband pictured in a T-Rex costume, uh, but I am going to dress up as Furiosa from the new Mad Max, which is why I just shaved my head because I'm dedicated to, to costumes um, and just going all in. So I will be Furiosa and my husband will be a war boy. So if you haven't seen Mad Max, that won't make any sense. And if you have, you might judge me because it's an insane movie, but I love it. All right, I'll go next. Um, I'm Jill Williams and I'm the vice chair for the Olympia chapter of Surfrider Foundation. Um, I did vote like the day my ballot came. Two others in my house too, so I'm happy we have three votes for now. Um, and I probably will not dress up this year, but if I was, I was going to be Sue Sylvester from Glee and uh, next year, my full track suit. I'll go out and clean up, but. So let's see if I'm going along the top. So Mike, you're next. So my name is Mike Behrens um, and I did vote and I think I turned my ballot in like a week ago, but was happy to go on yesterday and see that it had been accepted as well. So even better. And I will probably not dress up either, but um, when you, the minute you said something about a solo beach cleanup, I shot to my mind that a solo cup during the solo beach cleanup would be pretty <laughs> epic. Awesome. All right, Joe, you're next along the top. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, my name is Joe, Joe Wood. I am the, I'm the chair of the Olympia uh, Surfrider chapter. I dropped off my uh, ballot at a ballot drop box uh, recently. And 
I was just, I was, I was just racking my brain trying to think of what I was going to be uh, this year. But I, I have a suggestion uh, that I think would be good for some folks who are looking for ideas if they uh, want a good costume for this clean cleanup this weekend. Uh, during uh, a, few, a couple of years ago, during the uh, tragic Deepwater Horizon oil spill, I was a uh, I was an oil spill for Halloween, and it, you can get it if you just get a black cape. Uh, and these often you can find on sale at like Value Village at the last minute. You can get a big Dracula cape, and and then go to the to this to the uh, stuffed animal section, and I guarantee you'll find like little marine animals and and stuff and you just get a bunch of these um stuffed animals and i went so far as to tape little x's with electrical tape over their eyes and then then i safety pinned them to my uh cape and and so i was a, a oil spill <laughs> you still have this because so i feel like sad. it should go in like the surf rider box so. no 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 I think I mentioned it before too, but that was, yeah, that was my uh, costume and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty morbid, but you know, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get a lot of uh, questions and hopefully interest uh, while you're walking around on the beach looking like that. It's a powerful educational uh, opportunity. An opportunity. That's all I, that's all I have to That's right. All right, Dan, we'll have you go next. Hi, I'm, I live in Olympia. And um, I plan oysters. Uh, I'm a volunteer with the Olympia Oyster Seed Planting Project. We have a couple hundred members and we planted 150,000 oysters for environmental cleanup. One oyster can filter 50 gallons of water per day and they restore uh, fish habitat, uh, eel grass, and lots of uh, smaller organisms uh, breed in um, oyster beds. And that's me. We're gonna come back to you and get more information. Did you did you vote? And are you gonna dress oh, yeah, up this yeah. year? I voted with my mom. She's oh, uh, ninety. We sent our ballots in together. You betcha. We dropped them in the box. My mom lives eleven miles away from here, and uh, uh, by boat. But to drive to her house is seventy mile one way trip or one hundred forty mile round trip. But by boat, it's like a twenty minute little boat ride. So I go see her by boat, which makes visiting your mom a lot more fun, right? <laughs> Very cool. All right, Gus, you're next. Hey, hey I'm Gus uh, Gates. I'm the Washington Policy Manager, the second of two staff in Washington, along with Liz. And uh, yeah, uh, let's see. I, yes, of course I voted and turned it in like the day I got the ballot and dropped it in the box and verified that it was counted. So I'm feeling uh, pretty good about that. And uh, costume, I'm kind of torn. Uh, excuse me, a couple of different ideas in my head. Um, my kid is really big on this cartoon called PJ Masks. And he has gotten all of the family like these different masks and stuff like that, which I'll, I'll go along with. But I'm kind of torn on alternative costumes, possibly Bob Ross or uh, maybe um, Forrest mm -hmm. Gump in the running section of, of that. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, so I don't know. Any, any other ideas, I'm, I'm open. So let me know. <laughs> Definitely Bob Ross, if I had to vote. Bob sure. Ross. Is Happy good. clouds. <laughs> All right, Chris. You're... My name is Chris and I voted and I think for a costume I'd be a bird of some sort. Very cool. A All right, let's see. Or a land bird. Oh. Sea bird. Yes. Love it. Of course. Very good. Um and then Shirley and Wendell Carlson. You're muted. There we go. Okay, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. All right. So we live on Johnson Point um, on the water. We have uh, oyster. We have oyster beds. That we uh, bags that we um, buy and reseed every year. And we're really into all of this. Um, yes, we voted, of course, early, and then we actually drove down to the fire station and dropped our dropped our ballots off. So 
we're uh, feeling pretty good about that. Um, uh, we have lots of lots of uh, Halloween um, ideas, but uh, and, and probably we'd haul out maybe the I don't know. Is it, we have a clown wig. <laughs> we can do the we can be clowns or something on the beach. Don't know what we're gonna do. <laughs> It's a hard year. <laughs> yeah. It's a tough year. All the things that we're like, you know, you're thinking you could do, like Halloween's coming. And I was like, what are you going to do with that? But very cool. All right. Do Liz, do we have a couple more like business things we want to go through? We or? From Riley and Karen. I have them as the last. Oh, one. I see. I, because the camera's not on, it didn't come along top for me. So I'm not sure if we're here. Oh. Hi. issues with the camera, but uh, Riley and Karen Caton, and yes, we voted. We dropped it off at the uh, drop box close to our house, uh, probably the second day after we got ballots. I mean, no sense waiting. And um, if we were going to dress up this year for costumes, would probably just be a couple of old people, a couple <laughs> of old retired people. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you all for your introductions. And I'm so stoked to hear how prompt and efficient everybody has been at voting. I feel like I was the biggest slacker and that delights me. So thank you all for being such engaged citizens. Um, just a few quick chapter business updates. Um, we are hosting a costume cleanup competition um, where if you send us a picture on social media or our email account, uh, before the end of the day on Sunday, uh, you can win one of our brand new Schnazzy Olympia Surfrider t-shirts, uh, limited edition. Um, so it's just, it's pretty simple. If you dress up in a costume and go pick up some trash and take a picture and send it to us. So um, we're trying to give people an option to go out and enjoy running around in a costume um, that isn't trick-or-treating because obviously the pandemic is going to put a damper on um, running around in a costume trick-or-treating. So, um, so you can do that and pick up trash instead. Um, and so feel free to ask us any questions if any of those come up. Um, and then just a few chapter business points. Um, we are promoting a business sign-on letter. So um, we just have a recent blog post about seabed mining, which is extracting minerals and metals from the seafloor. Um, and we're trying to ban that practice in Washington state waters, which is a three mile limit from um, the low tide line. And um, yeah, if you, are, are, if you are a business owner or you know somebody who doesn't want seabed mining in our waters, um, we encourage you to check out our blog post. Um, maybe Gus will throw it in the chat because he's usually pretty good about that. Um, and it's, it takes like two seconds to sign up and we're gonna bring this to the legislation to try to hopefully ban this practice in our state waters um, because it has some really negative long-term effects that have particularly threatening consequences to our shellfish industry. Um, so if you're interested to hear or read more about what seabed mining is and what those potential um, threats it might cause, check out our blog post on it um, and feel free, free to send us um, any questions you might have and share that letter far and wide if you have any businesses or channels that you can do so. Um, because we definitely don't want industrial spritz, industrial scale mining in our state waters. Um, we did just want to give an update. A few months ago, earlier this summer, one of our chapter meetings, we had the documentary filmmakers of uh, Chehalis, A Watershed Moment, which is an excellent documentary about the Chehalis Basin and a proposed dam um, going up there. And if you aren't involved with that, I definitely recommend the documentary. It's available on Amazon right now um, if you have Prime, and I believe it is available YouTube, through YouTube. YouTube as well um, on the Pacific Rivers channel. And if you can review that documentary, if you have seen it, um, I'm always about supporting your, your documentary filmmakers because nobody gets rich making documentary films, and but they're very important. Um, and the public comment period is open now until November 17th. Um, so I will try to pull up and post that um, a link to that public comment page in the chat box um, before the end of the night. Um, and then just a final plug, we are always looking for executive committee members for our Olympia chapter. Um, so we are looking for a treasurer and a volunteer coordinator. Um, and who else am I forgetting? I forget. But yeah, if you're interested in volunteering or know somebody who is, um, 
We are always looking uh, for insight CEO, and ideas. CEO and COO and CFO. Yes, all of those acronyms. Bring it. <laughs> um, I think that's it, unless anybody has any other comments or updates. No, no. Cool. Well, then let's get to Oystober. Take it away. Awesome. All right. So we have two guests tonight. Um, we have Dan and Mike, both that are going to talk about different um, oyster seeding projects that are happening, one in Olympia, one in Tacoma-ish, Big Harbor-ish. Um, so we will start with Dan, who um, is with the Olympia Area Oyster Seeding Planting Club since 2005. Dan's Oyster Missouri. Planting Club has planted more than 150,000 oyster seeds around Bud Inlet and surrounding areas. Um, so Dan, if you'd like to give us a little background about how you got started in this, what you do, how people can get involved, and just kind of give us give us the skinny on on your project i think you're muted right now too so hear me now there you go yeah i love this picture that we're looking at on your screen <laughs> what is it uh this is, oh, is that? that's that dinner <laughs> this is from the there. internet <laughs> it's not local i wish it's from that. like a free free picture website. Those are, um, those website. are a famous kind of oyster that we plant here. There's many types of oysters. Those okay. oysters that you're looking at are called uh, uh, Crass Austria gigas, otherwise known as the Pacific oyster. And those are the commercial oyster that are that we eat in oyster bars. Um, you can also go to some oyster bars and get more exciting and exotic oysters that are different. But the big advantage of these oysters is they're extremely hardy. They grow in all sorts of conditions like dry beaches, wet beaches, underwater, above water, and they're very, they grow rapidly and they're quite large. So you can get a marketable Pacific oyster in about six months. And um, the, they come out to be shooter size or big. Go ahead. Was someone there? Did I hear someone? You keep going, I think. Okay. So, um, we plant a lot of those Pacific oysters. Those are really popular for planting. And one large Pacific oyster, after five years, they get to be eight inches long. They can filter 50 gallons of water per day. So they're like a little environmental cleanup, little monster. They are awesome. And there's famous photos. I was looking on my Facebook page. I don't have one really handy to show you where they have two fish tanks, like 100 gallon aquarium type thing, you know, made of the rectangular square glass looking things. They throw, uh, fill those up with dirty seawater that's really murky. And they throw like, you know, a hundred oysters in one tank and nothing in the other tank. And then overnight, the ones with the, the tank with the oysters in it, the water's totally clean. So they're highly effective, highly, um, really good filter feeders. Now there's another kind of oyster that's really popular, the Olympia oyster. Um, which is um, Austria, I can't remember. But anyway, um, they're really tiny. Um, after five years, they only get to be about the size of a silver dollar, um, but they're native. They're the original oyster that was all up and down from Canada to Mexico. And um, we're getting a lot more demand. You know, we've been doing this for 16 years, all around Olympia, up and down the sound, everywhere around here. We've been getting a lot more demand for people who wanna replant native oysters, Olympia oysters. They're like, hey man, what are these oysters you're planting on my beach? Are these natives? And we're like, oh no, ma'am, I'm sorry, but these are actually Pacific oysters. Oh, they filter 50 gallons a day. And they're like, okay, well, that's great, but we want to have the native oysters. We want to put back the environment that was here. And this is getting really to be the thing nowadays, as you guys know, um, you know, restoring native salmon runs, you know, keeping native orca populations alive, restoring uh, native beaches, and um, you know, returning our environment to what it was. So um, we have planted Olympia oysters on an experimental basis around here. We can grow them. They're hard to grow. They need to be in water all the time. Even when the tide is out, they need to be wet. So Pacific oysters can hang out on gravel beaches, dry beaches, whatever, as long as they get in the tide, they're okay for part of the day. But Olympia oysters, no. Olympia oysters will freeze in the winter 
and they will dry out in the summer. So we have to plant them in more muddy waters, but we're going to go for it this year. We decided we're going to make a concerted effort. Um, there's a lot of people that are nervous about planting Olympia oysters. Uh, they're not sure it's the right thing to do environmentally. They're not sure about if we should bring back those native oysters. They weren't very successful as a commercial crop, but we have a lot of supporters who really, they want to see our native stuff return. So we're going to give it a shot. So I just told you about the two kinds of oysters, Pacific oysters, Olympia oysters. Just to remind you, we have 200 members around Olympia. We plant a ton of oysters. I did it for like four months this year. We had an extremely active um, volunteer group here. Um, uh, right here, we have Shirley Carlson, who's an incredible oyster planter. And um, she's thrown down herself, like I'm um, just thinking off the top of my head, um, at least 10,000 oysters over the years, together with um, uh, her neighbor, Mary, who is awesome. Say hi to Mary for me. Thank you. So Dan, how do people get involved? If, how do they find you if they are interested in getting- Just give me a call. My number is 360-250-3407. You have give a website? A and my number, my email address is danleemazur at gmail.com. You want me to take, uh, my son here is the Zoom expert. He's in third grade, he's eight. <laughs> and he's gonna um, have me type this into the chat. Right. Awesome. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Am I doing this right, son? Yeah, okay. Put my number in here. So Dan, uh, where do you get the seed for the oysters every year? Uh, we buy the seed from the hatchery. Uh, is that the hatchery is- um, Taylor or? Uh, no, uh, we buy it from um, Jen, who's awesome. Jen is great. Uh, she's a native. She grew up on Totten Inlet and she grows the most killer good oysters you've ever seen. Nice. They're awesome. And, and uh, we are familiar. Um, Gus, you mentioned Taylor, uh, the Taylor, uh, I believe it's called Taylor Shellfish Farms. They're the largest oyster uh, shellfish producer, commercial shellfish producer in the US. And um, they're massive, um, they control the market. Um, they're very powerful and everyone does what they say. And they provide a there lot of jobs go. in the communities and <clears throat> have a lot of really good oyster bars too. So And they own oyster bars. They have horizontal, um, it's called horizontal, is it integration? Horizontal and vertical integration. Like they own all the oyster beds, they own the oyster bars, they own the oyster trucks, they own the oyster growers. They're big. Like we're talking 70 million a year, Gus. They're huge. I'm well aware. I met, <clears throat> um, just, I met Maria Cantwell and Katie Murray at an oyster um, uh, feed at their place. So they know a lot of people, man. They can get stuff done and they're awesome. Agreed. Yep. Dan, a quick question for you. Is people's concern about out planting Olympia oysters purely about whether or not they'll survive or are there other mm -hmm. concerns about um, out planting all these? Well, um, is your name Mike? Yes, it is. Well, Mike, it's great to meet you and hear that you're planting oysters up there. I yeah. want to hear about what you do. I'm excited. This is what's great about these kind of forums is we can do a little networking. Um, but I, I don't know anything about what you do, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing it. But you probably know that planting oysters is somewhat controversial. And um, some people like it and some people don't. And, um, you know, oysters grow great all around but that doesn't necessarily mean that people want to grow oysters on their beautiful tidelands or whatever and then there's other factors like um there are um uh you know different companies who've gone around buying up lots of tidelands and um have really kind of captured the market in certain ways um there's a there's a lot of different stuff going on out there and your question about the olympia oysters is really interesting and um there's quite a movement of people who don't want to see Olympia oysters planted. Interesting. They don't want the native oyster to come back. Why? I don't know. I think there's various reasons for that. I think part of it is that um, they're worried about giving up space on their beaches for non-commercial oysters. Nobody wants to buy an Olympia oyster after five years, only as big as a silver dollar, as you know, Mike. So they're really, I mean, people say they taste delicious, but, you go back and read the old historic accounts, it's fascinating. I mean, in one quart, there was 1,200 oysters or something, you know, it was like, 
that was when there weren't Pacific oysters, you know, so they tried to grow Olympia oysters. So they had to grow 1200 oysters to fill a quart jar with uh, shucked oysters. So, you know, they're, they're, they're not in, there's no demand in the commercial market. That's part of it. I think part of it is that there's a bit of nervousness about messing with mother nature and that, Hey, there's a reason that maybe, I mean, I think maybe some people think this, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I think some people think that there's a reason that these oysters um, kind of are threatened or died out and that yeah, over maybe they don't really succeed <laughs> here in this environment, you know, kind of like salmon. Like maybe, maybe they're not really like the right thing to have here. I mean, there's a lot of characters out there. I mean, I look at these amazing beaches all the time and I'm like, wow, you know, you could plant some oysters here and it would be great. And then people are like, you know, I don't really like oysters. They're kind of dirty. And, you know, so there's a lot of controversy. I know you run into this, Mike, because I see it all the time. It's the classic one is the family. There'll be a family and one part of the family wants to plant the oysters and the other part doesn't. And they all, they live in the same house. You know, yeah. Same and place. it may be somewhat the, the region of Puget Sound and that um, I have not run into that. And instead, and it's pr probably also the community I'm tied into um, up here is that um, there is a, a strong financial as well as sort of ecological push to um, restore Olis. Um, so um, but I will um, agree with Gus um, and, um, and I'm gonna, if it's okay, I'm gonna plop up a slide. Um, from another talk I've given. Um, I'm gonna see if I can pull this off. Um, Cause it shows it pretty well. Um, Is it working for you? Yeah, but I've got multiple slides simultaneously. Um, so this is um, just an, an old um, graph showing um, oyster harvest or, or production and and Dan is absolutely right it takes a lot of these little guys um, let's see if I can pull up a high laser pointer you can see these are all little tiny Olympia oysters growing on a great big Pacific oyster shell mm -hmm. uh, and if you look historically at the harvest of these um, it it peaked in Willapa Bay on the coast in the late 1800s, um, and it peaked because of the gold, ru gold rush, actually. So these oysters were getting shipped to California, and um, they could make it in a, a ship from Willapa Bay to San Francisco Bay and still be alive. They couldn't make it from Puget Sound to Willapa Bay, or to San Francisco Bay via ship. They'd die and rot before they got there. So it was actually the advent of both the railroad and steamships that allowed Puget Sound oysters to be harvested dramatically um, and then shipped to California. And so we had a massive overharvest um, and what we call a, a cereal depletion. So they depleted Willapa Bay, the dark circles first, and then Puget Sound later. Um, and and the other thing that that did was it removed a ton of shell because they shipped them in the actual shell. And when you, the oysters actually need shell to resettle as, as larvae back onto. So there was both an over harvest and a, a habitat um, modification or destruction issue. Um, and I will say that the state is, at least at the state level, um, very interested in um, bringing Oli's back. Um, but I do s hear your point about some people not wanting to grow them on their beaches for various reasons, especially if you want to eat them. Um, they're delicious, I've had them, um, but it does take a while to, to get to an edible size and you can grow um, Cross Austria Gigas, the Pacific Oyster, much faster. People want that quick fix. Yeah. I'm gonna put it in and eat it. Well, let's, that's just, that was a perfect segue right into Mike. You give us our presentation about, so this is Michael, Michael Behrens, who is um, 
going to talk to us tonight, I have my little script, um, about experimental oyster restoration project that he's working on at Penrose Point on the Key Peninsula. Mike's a professor of marine ecology at Pacific Lutheran University, University in Tacoma and works with um, mostly Harbor Wild Watch, but also Pierce County, UW Tacoma, and Coastal Conservation Association. So tell us about your project and then we'll see how we can get all these, all of it intertwined. So I do have a, uh, a little bit of a, a presentation, at least with some um, pretty pictures, but hopefully those will keep you interested while, while listening to me. Um, so I, I wanna give, a little bit of credit to other folks. This is a little bit of a Frankenstein presentation put together from like three different people that have given talks on this to a bunch of different groups. And so um, I just like this project is not a single person. Um, this presentation is sort of put together by a, a number of them and I will talk about them um, sort of as, as we go. Um, but thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to this group about this project. And, um, and it is a little bit different in that we are entirely focused on native oysters for this project. Um, and in the central sound, and more so the central sound, so the Silverdale, Bremerton area, um, and parts of Hood Canal, there are large scale restorations of Olympia oysters. They're much rarer and the South Sound, there are some small scale ones. And we're actually running this as a, as a pilot product project to try and understand what are some of the things that impact the success of restoration and, and what are some of the maybe unanticipated outcomes of a restoration as well. So um, really quick, if I can get my slideshow to work at least. Um, so there are really two different ways that we do um, Ole restoration, and I'm gonna just call it Olympia oysters. Um, and, and as Dan said, these are in a different genus. It's, it's Austria lurida, if you care about the genus and species. Um, but I'm gonna call them Ole's from here on out. Um, so basically with Ole's, there's two different ways that we go about um, doing restorations for them. Um, and one is similar to the work that Dan's group does and probably very similar to what they will be trying with Ole's, which are reseeding efforts. And usually in these reseeding efforts, it's a mix of putting down some shell material for these, for the larvae of the um, oysters to attach to, um, but then also tossing out um, adults or juveniles of those oysters um, around that, that newly laid down shell material. And that shell material is almost always Pacific oyster shell because it's just readily abundant because of the, the shellfish culture industry. And, and so this is actually a project that's going, up, going on up on the Olympic Peninsula. One of the local tribes has a project um, trying to bring back Ole's to um, Discovery Bay. Um, this is the other sort of avenue that, that they go, and I'm sort of using the field of dreams um, analogy here of um, if you build it, they will come. Um, and this is often the, um, the large scale restoration uh, methods used by um, a central sound group called Puget Sound Restoration Fund. And, um, and they will use these, they'll go into an area, and this is an entire barge covered in Olympia, or sorry, Pacific oyster shell. And they use a fire hose and they blast it off the barge. And it spreads out across the bottom. And then they are using areas that have um, larvae of the native oysters of all these floating around in them already, but not appropriate habitat for them to settle. And so what they're waiting for are juvenile oysters to um, settle onto these Pacific oyster shells and build up across time. Um, there are the occasional sort of things that fall in the middle and we're trying to bridge the middle a little bit in our project. 
So that's just a little bit of background on Ole restoration in Puget Sound. And please go ahead and stop me at any point if you've got questions or comments, I don't mind being interrupted. Mike, uh, could you tell us what your email address is? Um, I can. Um, I can put it in the chat. Yeah, if Joe can put it in the chat, that'd be great. Um, so our project um, is, is happening, um, as Jill said, at Penrose Point on the Key Peninsula, so near Lake Bay. Um, and if you've ever been to that park, um, what you, there's a parking area here for a beach and then a little point and a sand spit that goes out here. A campground is over in this area. There's a dock here. And our area that we're working is, is in through here. And we've got a number of, of test plots we're doing and, and ecological transects in other locations. I do want to point out that this is a pretty big partnership of folks from various areas. Um, so Pierce County Surface Water Management um, has partnered with us recently um, with the National Estuary Program grant and um, Tacoma Pierce Department of Health. Um, not Tacoma Pierce, sorry, um, Washington Department of Health. Um, there are two universities involved. So University of Washington Tacoma and Bonnie Becker and her students, um, POU and, and my, me and my students, Harbor Wild Watch, which is a local um, environmental education nonprofit. And I know there's some folks here from the South Sound Surf Riders um, chapter and Stina Troyer, um, who's the, the chair of that group is actually heavily involved or works for Harbor Wild Watch and heavily involved in this, this project. Um, we're funded by Coastal Conservation Association for part of this work. And there are just tons of volunteers to mix in as well. Um, so I wanna, whoop, one too far. Um, so I put this under the heading of it takes a village. Um, so there is a lot of work that goes on in this project. And, um, and so I just wanted to throw some pictures out here of various folks. Um, some of these overlap, but we've got UWT students in multiple places, UWT staff members, and in this case, her daughter. Um, we've got Stina, who works for Harbor Wild Watch, um, Bonnie, my collaborator at UWT, Stina's mom, who comes out and helps, um, and even my daughter, who on occasion um, will drag her into the garage in COVID times to work on the microscope. So, um, so just lots of people helping um, and, and a lot of work that goes into it. So the, the goals of this study um, are really to um, look at a restoration on both sides. So the beginning or before it starts and after it, it begins. Most restoration projects just look at the after. And so we are interested in looking at both sides and using something called a before after control impact model where we're looking at before and after the restoration and we're doing that at both a control site, a short distance away from the, um, the project, and then our impact site of, of Penrose Point. And, um, and we're taking advantage of a long-term data set that Stina and I have been um, running a project to look at the sort of ecological health of a number of our South Sound beaches. Um, this is a picture of some of that work, and this happens to be at Penrose. Um, and so utilizing data that we've been collecting since 2013 as that, that pre-data. Um, obviously, there's the, the sort of restoration part of things, but we also are interested in training our students and then engaging the public, both in the science as well as just teaching them about our local beaches, the restoration process, and the story of native oysters. And I think the big difference here is we have a, an ecological focus on the whole community rather than just the, the oysters themselves. Um, and so around that sort of whole ecological community, we are doing um, fish surveys at both, our, both Penrose Point and Maple Hollow, our, our control area. 
Um, we're doing algae and invertebrate surveys. Um, we're doing some shoreline mapping to see how habitat might change in those areas if oysters start to come back in a meaningful way. We're also looking at what we call oyster recruitment. So this is how many baby oysters come back into our locations. And we do that using these, um, we call them shell strings. It's a wooden dowel with a stack of Pacific oyster shells. And we, we leave them out for a week or two at a time and then take them back and look at them under the microscope and look for baby oysters that are about the, the size of the thickness of a human hair. So we've been doing this for a couple years um, leading up to this, these algal and invertebrate surveys for since 2013, the fish surveys through um, since 2013, the oyster recruitment and the shoreline mapping just the last two years. And then we were excited that this fall, we finally um, got the, the permits that we need and everything else came together and we're jumping ahead again. And we went from mapping out where we were gonna put these um, small test plots for oyster restoration out at Penrose. We have, as I mentioned, five of them. Um, and we mapped them out into slightly different habitats that we thought might have different levels of oyster survival. And then we brought in a bunch of Pacific oyster shell. Um, and um, when I say a bunch, I mean a lot, like six cubic yards of it. Um, Luckily, it was brought in on a barge and dropped off in bags, and we only had to unload the bags. We didn't have to um, carry it along the beach. Then we came out about two days later, um, and each of these 10 by 10 um, foot plots got somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 um, Olympia oysters on them. Um, so as mentioned before, they're much smaller. These are probably two-year-old um, Olympia oysters. Um, here in, uh, this is either my hand or Stina's hand, it might be Stina's. Um, and then we spread them out on the shell, and here you can make out a bunch of these small oysters on the Pacific oyster shell. Um, and our goal with this is then to hopefully establish native oyster populations on these plots, which can export larvae, or they'll mate, and those larvae will hopefully recolonize other nearby areas, as well as on those shell plots itself. Um, but we wanna know also what is the, um, the survival and growth of these oysters on these test plots, because there are, are lots of, of concerns. As Dan noted, Olympia oysters need to be wet almost all the time. Um, and so we put these at a much lower tidal height than we would put Pacific oysters um, down about the, the zero tide height. Um, and they're also readily eaten by things like crabs. And we, we have already lost a good chunk of them, we think, to predation. But we go out every couple months now, and we're tracking both survival by counting them in quadrats so we can estimate the number of, of oysters still on these plots, as well as, as measuring them. And so we can track both their survival, but also their growth across time. Um, and then looking towards the future, um, we plan on continuing this monitoring to figure out now that we have populations of oysters, and by the way, I didn't mention this, but in um, two years, we have seen, we think three oyster larvae in two complete summers of, of looking um, in Penrose and Maple Hollow at the control site. For comparison's sake, I've worked up at Fidalgo Bay near Anacortes on another restoration site. And there were individual shells that we got on that study that at the height of reproduction would have 20 to 50 oyster larvae per shell. Um, and instead of the um, 420 shells we had out at these two sites, um, that we looked at every other week between May and October and only found um, at most three larvae in a year. So very low levels of, of larvae out there. We're hoping that those will increase, but we wanna see, do they start colonizing other areas? Um, and then do we start seeing the other changes that Dan mentioned, those, those community-wide changes around other species that utilize um, habitats with oysters like um, like fish. So 
Um, there's going to be a lot of continued monitoring. We've signed on to this thing for, for many, many years. Um, we want to continue doing public outreach like this, as well as once we're allowed to do beach walks again, post COVID, um, getting out there with the public and being able to show them the test plots and, and talk about what we're doing. And then I think ultimately, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, one of the reasons they've supported us up until this point um, is the potential to do a, a large scale um, restoration at this site. And, and that is dependent upon both the success of our program, but also issues around permitting both through the state parks and the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I should point out um, one of the reasons that some groups don't do the large spreading of shells um, like Puget Sound Restoration Fund is that is controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers um, and is, can be a really lengthy process to um, get those permits. Um, that's all I have for you, um, at least talking about our um, project, but I am happy to um, answer any, any questions or um, talk about any other oyster things. Um, I'm sure Dan and I can both answer questions around those. Well, I, I could chime in with a question here. Um, Dan yeah. or Mike, um, one of the things I do in my <clears throat> job role is represent ocean recreation users on the Marine Resource Advisory Council focusing on ocean acidification uh, for the state of Washington. Um, I'm curious if there are differences in the resiliency and adaptation between Pacific oysters and Olympia oysters in a, you know, changing ocean chemistry environment that we find ourselves in. Yeah, um, I know that there's some stuff that just came out on that um, in the literature. And unfortunately, I have not read it. <laughs> um, I, I haven't either. It's okay. But what I will point out, and actually one of the areas of concern for me and for some other folks, and, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why working now to, um, to restore Olympia oysters as much as we can is that um, we know that they react really differently to water temperature. Um, and, um, and Pacific oysters were actually introduced with the idea that they would never reproduce on their own um, in Puget Sound. Um, it doesn't get warm enough for them generally and definitely didn't um, when they were initially introduced um, for them to survive as larvae. Um, with some notable exceptions, if you've ever been to Belfair, you know that there are big oyster reefs there. That's an area that gets really warm in the summer when these are reproducing, and, and they have been long established in Belfair. Um, starting in 2005 in the South Sound, we've seen widespread successful reproduction of Pacific oysters during the beginning of what's referred to as the marine heat wave, which was, if you paid attention to things like the blob, not the, the bad movie, but the area of warm water off the coast of the Pacific Northwest for many years, and the accompanying El Ninos, we now refer to that as the first marine heat wave. And that was associated with um, many of these beaches that we work on in the South Sound that never had populations of Pacific oysters um, now being dominated by Pacific oysters. And so, unfortunately, in those warm years, we've also seen reproductive failures of Olympia oysters. Um, and so, there is a concern that as things warm, um, it may shift the, um, the balance in terms of reproduction. And so, we want to make sure that there's enough olies around that in those cold years or the cooler years, they can reproduce and they can survive just fine as adults in that warmer conditions, but their larvae don't do as well. Um, and, and so we're hoping that um, there's, there's enough genetic variation in there to allow them to do well. And I will say, and Dan mentioned this, olies are found all the way from Northern Baja to Alaska. And so there are, species, or are populations that deal with much warmer water than we see, um, though, 
I have not heard anyone talk about um, moving southern oysters um, north yet to deal with climate change, but I would guess that is a conversation we will have in the next years or decades. So what you're saying is biodiversity builds resilience in our ecosystem. Shockingly, yes. That is exactly what I'm saying. I think I read, um, I don't know if I think it was UW, maybe it was Sea Grant, that when exposed to environmental stressors like increased temperatures and acidification, the Olympia oyster, like the parent oysters, were able to basically pass that environmental stress, you know, if you want to call it memory, onto their offspring and imparted higher survival for offspring of oysters that underwent stress like acidification. But with the Pacific oysters, I think it was the opposite where the parent oysters, when exposed to a bunch of stressors, uh, their offspring had lower survival. So I think that was one yeah. of the studies I read recently. Yeah, I, that rings a bell um, as, as one of those ones that's, that's just come out. And, and we also are noticing there's a, a fair amount of local adaptation in these um, Olympia oyster populations. We don't think these larvae go very far. Um, they're a super cool species. Um, so they are, um, they're hermaphrodites, um, meaning that during part of their life they're male and part of their life they're female, and they actually alternate. Um, so those species that are normally hermaphrodites shift from one sex to the other, um, and then they get stuck in that new one. These ones just go back and forth. And when they're female, they produce eggs. Um, and then the males produce packets of sperm, which they release into the water. And the females actually draw it in like they're eating. So as they're filter feeding, but they recognize it's a packet of sperm and not food. And then they fertilize their eggs with it. And then they brood them for two to probably four weeks. And then they um, release them as later stage larvae. Um, the, the Pacific oysters don't do that. And so the Pacific oyster larvae go really far. And we think that those native oyster larvae don't travel so far because they spend part of their early life inside the shell of the mother. Fascinating stuff. Dan, do any of your oyster uh, members, do any of them uh, grow Kumamoto's? Yeah, yeah, Robbie here grows Kumamoto's. Robbie, oh, I got my <laughs> eight-year-old son here. He's actually quite an oyster farmer. He's becoming an oyster farmer. He's pretty good at it. And uh, we have tried Kumamoto's. Those are cool, those oysters that you mentioned. I can't remember the Latin name, but those are a famous oyster that are um, – you know, uh, they look, uh, they're a little smaller than the big Pacific oyster, but they're larger than the Olympia oyster. And they have these interesting shells with these long, almost little fingers that stick off the shells. And they're supposed to have a really much more yummy flavor. And um, for oyster eating aficionados, you know, there's, there's quite a few kinds of oysters like Virginicas, Kumamoto's, there's, oh my gosh, um, Gus, I bet you know some too, because you know about Kumamoto's um there's um oh my gosh i can't remember all the different ones um i really want to try those ones where you buy smoked oysters in that little can <laughs> remember those when you're a kid and you get a can of smoked yeah. oysters and put them on some crackers oh man those things those oh there you go oh thank you <laughs> that is the picture right there mike's man. got a slide for everything i love it i love it i've got like three different talks open so um thank you things as we go um, and it's actually an interesting part of the oyster story for um, Washington is that, um, so we initially had our Olympia oysters, and then the first oysters that were introduced here were um, the Atlantic oysters, so across Austria, Virginica, sometimes referred to as either Eastern or just Virginicas. So those came in in the 1870s, um, the Pacific oysters later around 1900, and a lot of this had to do with technology of the day. So we could get Atlantics here once the railroad was completed and people learned how to transport them in um, basically like wooden wine casks. 
Pacific oysters, we then figured out how to get from Asia via boats. Um, and then later brought in Kumamoto's, and here you can see those finger-like extensions that Dan was talking about. Um, so another cross Austria species. And then we even have another one, and someone has recently sent me pictures from the Seattle area that I think are these guys, or the European flat oyster, or the Balan. Um, and this is in the same um, genus and a close relative of our Olympia oysters. And so we have at least five different species that exist um, in Puget Sound. And Mike, if, if I recall correctly from your earlier graph, the timing of the introduction of Virginica and the Pacifics kind of coincided with major declines in yeah. the Olympia oysters, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, here's about the point where you're getting um, your um, Atlantic or your Virginicas, and then um, a little bit just after 1900 when you start getting your, your Pacifics. But some of that was also, as I mentioned, just the sheer luck of, of the railroad. Um, and the railroad also coincides with the decline of Puget Sound or the exploitation of Puget Sound oysters. So um, it, it just worked out well that the railroad to San Francisco got finished a little bit after the railroad from the, the East Coast. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. I want to ask a question if I may. Okay. I've talked to a lot of old timers that live around here and they said that they can remember when they were little kids, like in the 1930s, in some of the bays that are a little more further away from Olympia, you know, like going out into Elb Bay and Henderson, yep. some extent, Houghton, Oyster Bay. And they, could, yeah. they told me they remembered when there were sections where it was hard to walk on the beach because there's so many oysters, you would cut your feet up. Yeah. It was like really thick, like oyster reefs, thick, thick, uh -huh. thick, thick, thick. And I've been turning that over in my mind, and I was wondering if it might have taken like hundreds of years to make those oyster reefs. And that what we've seen is maybe we think of it as overfishing or whatever of oysters. But maybe what we're also seeing is that we're not waiting long enough for hundreds of years to restore those oyster beds to what they were. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I think there's there's a there's a little bit to that that I would agree with. So, um, but there's also I think something causing that time lag to be much longer than it needs to be. So, um, so a couple things though. One, um, Pacific oysters generate reefs and um, and actually all the Crest Austria, so Virginica from the East Coast as well, generate reefs relatively quickly. Like there used to be massive reefs in Chesapeake Bay and New York Bay or New York Harbor, things like that. Um, and, um, and so that genus tends to grow in such a way that generates reefs better than um, Austria, the genus of Ollies. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't get large aggregations of them. Um, and we see that on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and indeed, we see it in many of our, um, our really successful restoration areas. Um, and, and so the issue is um, both um, overharvest, and, and overharvest was two things. One, it reduced the numbers, the number of reproductive individuals. But the other thing it did was it reduced the availability of calcium carbonate shells for those larvae to settle out on. And you really have to develop that first before you're going to get a large um, Olympia oyster population. So let me see if I can find another slide in my pr presentation and get back, show you a picture of Fidalgo. Um, so Fidalgo Bay up near Anacortes is an area that um, has had a, um, a restoration going on for a number of years. 
And this is not the greatest picture I'm going to show you, but it, it'll be better than describing it. Um, so for those of you who have not been up there, or if you have, Anacortes with the ferry um, is up here. Fidalgo Bay is this big muddy bay that you drive by on the way out there. Um, there's actually a trestle that you can ride a bike or walk across right here. And years ago, um, this guy, Paul Donnell, um, and Bill Taylor of Taylor Shellfish fame, he's sort of the, the patriarch of that group. Um, and then Betsy Peabody from Puget Sound Restoration Fund went and they dumped a bunch of oyster shell off this trestle um, over in this area and then threw out some native oysters and there were some native oysters th there for a while. Over the years there's been more and more shell added in to this bay, um, especially up in this region and up in this region. Um, and now what you have is reproduction of Olympia oysters onto Pacific oyster shell, as well as hard shell clams like little neck clam shells and things like that. And this went from years of being under 10,000 oysters to a really rapid increase in the last five years where the estimates now there might be as many as 5 million native oysters in this bay. Wow. And, and it's really the confluence of getting enough reproducing individuals there with enough habitat for those larvae to settle and, and become um, juveniles and then ultimately grow up. And so I just point that out to say that um, I think it's a little bit of both. It's both a habitat issue, but I think it's also a reproduction issue. I have a question for Dan. Uh, the, 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 on the, the reseeding program, when, when, when you, what is, what is an oyster quote unquote seed? How, how does this work? I don't, I don't get, I don't get it. What do you provide to people? Well, you know, I, I'm going to give my um, analysis of it, the whole situation. I'm not a scientist like Mike is. So Mike's going to, Mike, please hold your laughter. Okay. And then, uh, an oyster seed is about as big as your um, fingernail. Um, if it's not a very old seed, it's about as big as your pinky fingernail. Okay. And if it's like a little older, it's as big as your thumbnail. Now the seeds we buy, they grow up in Hawaii in a thermal business park uh, in the Big Island or Kona or somewhere like that. I don't know. It's on one of those volcanoes over there. Mike knows all about it. And all the oyster seeds that are grown nowadays come from there. Huh. None of them are like grown up in Puget Sound. They come on FedEx um, huh. in a little uh, styrofoam box. I saw one the other day and that styrofoam box is like, you know, it's the size of like a coffee can and it has like, you know, like Mike's talking like 5 million oyster babies in it or something like that. Huh. And the guy who grows these oysters in the uh, Kona Business Park is named Hawaiian Brian. And <laughs> he works with uh, Taylors and then there's a famous company that's a huge oyster growing company called Goose Point Oysters and you might know about them they're out huh. in the Bay and they've been around forever and um so we get these seeds then we buy them from the hatchery they they buy them from Hawaiian Brian on the FedEx thing they come in a giant you know in a little container five million and then they throw them in what's called a flupsy and Mike will tell you all about a flupsy it's basically um a, a, a raft that floats out on the salt water in a bay and um, salt water is pumped over these little babies at a rapid rate or whatever. And um, you know, they're filter feeders. So they figured out that these little babies will grow great if you pump salt water over them in this raft. And they get up to a size, uh, like your pinky or you know whatever. And then the hatchery gets them at the flupsy and then they put them out in special planting trays and then they grow up to bigger size, like the size of your thumbnail. And that's when we plant them. Now the old school way that Mike's gonna tell you about, which everyone loves and is just awesome. And you can drive out to Willapa Bay and still see a few oyster hatcheries, not too many, but there's a couple out there. They built these wooden racks that stood up in the tide. And then when the tide went out, the racks are maybe, you know, like five, six feet off the ground or whatever. And they would um, have these um, throw oyster shells that like Mike was talking about, like Pacific oyster shells up into these racks. 
and then I don't really know the whole process, but Mike will tell you all about it. And then they would, um, the little baby oyster, they call them spat or something like that, larvae, would stick on these shells and then they would bag up those shells in bags that a, you know, uh, a human could lift of maybe, what do you want to say, Mike, like 20, 30 pound bags, yeah, shell right, bags. And that's the way we used to plant oysters. And I don't know if Shirley remembers that when we started planting oysters like 16 years ago, Shirley, do you remember we delivered these shell bags? We had rent a trailer and drive around Olympia with this bag of lo huge load of dripping 30 pound oyster shell bags and we'd carry them down the beach. You know, we looked like Paul Bunyan, you know, care, you know, sometimes people would drag them and they'd leave like oyster shell drag marks across their sidewalk. Now we put the seeds, these tiny little seeds, like the size of your thumbnail, Joe, we put these into these, uh, two by three foot mesh bags. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture. They look like big black envelopes. They're really sturdy mesh. And then we stake those bags down to the mud flat. We zip time shut. We've actually mm. been experimenting with more reasonable stuff. So we don't use zip ties anymore. We're starting to use these little, like surely you got to see this stuff. It's called yonks. And it's like a little closure thing that we have that you can you reuse over and over because zip ties really suck. You know, you have to clip them off and then what do you do? Throw them away. So don't, we're going to try not to use those. We're getting a whole pile of these yonk things. So surely you're going to be doing that next year. I'm sorry. And, um, and that's how you grow an oyster. Mm. Did I say it right? Okay. okay. Yeah. Mike, so, the <laughs> so we use a slightly, we actually buy ours from Taylor because we're buying Oli's. Um, they are produced here. Um, and, um, and basically there's two major, not major, there's two places you can get Oli's right now. Um, Taylor is commercially the place you can get them. And you can actually buy Oli's to outplant on your beach. Um, they'll sell them to you. Um, they're, they vary in price based on the size. Um, we ordered 15,000 and, um, and ordered them a while back. And so they've been holding 15,000 for us. Um, and they just got big. So ours were like the size of a quarter. Um, when we got them, but we expected they were gonna be like fingernail size um, and like pinky fingernail size, not like thumb fingernail size. Um, but our permits got held up. And so it took us a little bit longer. Um, but Puget Sound Restoration Fund, the other group I mentioned, they're a nonprofit out of Bainbridge and they do basically kelp restoration, Pinto abalone restoration and Olympia oyster restoration. And they have a, um, a hatchery system at the Manchester Labs out near Port Orchard. And so they grow their own seed there. Um, I just saw yesterday, they have a pretty good Instagram um, account. And so they just posted pictures of these like vats of Olympia oyster seeds that they had um, that they were getting ready to outplant. So they're doing more outplanting than they used to now that they have a hatchery facility. Um, and so it really depends on which species you're dealing with. Um, and even I think Puget Sound Restoration Fund is starting to think about um, growing them in a different way. So Taylor shellfish, um, instead of settling them on like a shell, they do it on little chunks of shell. So you get like one oyster per chunk, and then you get a, a single oyster which can then be grown up and eaten and things like that. But for restoration, you'd really love to have like groups of three or four together. And so I know that Puget Sound Restoration Fund was talking about starting to use like bigger chips, like maybe quarter size chips of shell um, and then settling larvae onto those because then you'll get groups of oysters, which can be really important for reproduction. The scary thing about all of this is that um, we don't put shell out to collect spat like we used to for a couple reasons. One, reproduction of Pacific oysters here is, um, isn't always predictable um, because it, um, it's so much dependent upon water temperature. We really can't use it for Olympia oysters because there's just not enough reproducing Olympia oysters to produce the larvae to be able to collect enough spat. Now it's just easier to grow them in a hatchery.
Oh, Mike, thank you so much. Um, so glad you guys set up this meeting so I could learn so much about oyster growing instead of just planning these things. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to call you. No problem. Thank you. I guess I was wondering through all this, I'm wondering why anyone would not want oysters growing on their beach. But I actually have a friend who, who uh, lived in Belfair, and it was literally dangerous walking out to his boat because there was so many shells. So I could see maybe there how that could be a concern, but otherwise it's like, it's kind of just baffling why you wouldn't want to yeah. be into that. Less of a concern for Olympia oysters. Um, they, um, because they're smaller, they're, they're not nearly as sharp um, as the shells. For the most part, you can walk over a bunch of olies and not even notice that they're there. Uh, yeah. And so, um, yeah, and I, like I can't figure out why people don't want to grow Olympia oysters. Like I've, I've, I'm running up against that all the time. They're like, huh. they're like, you know, these things, you know, I don't know, and and especially, you know, in surprising places like, you know, regs, people that write regulations and stuff. You know, they're like, oh. Is it gonna mess up the gene pool or something like that? Or don't they all they all, they all come from the same gene pool around here? Like, cause they all grew up around here. They've been breeding them around here. Is that right? Or so that actually is a valid concern. Um, and so because you have local adaptation of these populations, so um, the larvae tend to get stuck in a certain area, and so. Your, your populations can evolve to be a little bit different. Um, there is a concern about mixing animals from like different basins, like taking North Sound animals and putting them in the South Sound, or even putting Central Sound animals in the South Sound. So there is some concern about that. Um, what about Totten Inlet? What's that? What about Totten Inlet? Um, how about how about taking oysters from Hammersley Inlet and putting them in Eld Inlet? Is that risk? I think if you're moving around to closely related ones, or it shouldn't matter too much. Can um, we get that in writing, Mike? <laughs> well, because I mean, me. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to restore Olympia oysters in Olympia, how are yeah. you going to do it? You know, if you're yeah. telling people they can't take Olympia oyster babies from Hammersley Inlet and put them in Bud Inlet, then how are you going to do it? How are you going to bring Olympia oysters back? Yeah, well, and I think the reality is that we need to get the hatcheries that are producing them to produce oysters for the body of water that they are going to be grown up in. Um, and, and that is that's a lesson we've learned from salmon hatcheries. I mean, well, we should have learned from salmon hatcheries, um, but um, I think that is just a logistical issue. And it's one that I had to um, deal with with the state parks for our state parks permit um, was, and we basically told them that, look, there's no oysters in there at all right now. And so, um, we're, we use South Sound stock, um, and, and that's the best we could do at this point. PSRF tends to use Central Sound stock for their work um, because that's where they're working. And so, um, I mean, my opinion is at some point you have to say, let's put it out there. And if it's not well adapted for the environment, they won't survive. Um, it's it's whether or not you continually outplant bad genetics versus put them out and sort of let natural selection um, take its, its process or have that process play out. So it's, that is the only issue in my mind that I can come up with, but it doesn't explain why a private citizen wouldn't want always on their beach, but it might explain why, um, DNR, Department of Ecology, doesn't want to get into it. Um, but I will say that um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has their own designated ole restoration areas. Um, and there is an ole restoration plan. 
And so um, as long as sort of you're working within those constructs, at least there is a state agency behind it. And, and there are lots of people within WDFW interested in Ole restoration. Cool. Any more questions? Does anybody else have anything else to? I plugged in a little information I found from an old Thurston talk article that had pricing. Dan, you probably would know that's probably not current, but at least gives an idea of kind of what it costs to go into the costs that would go into buying a grow bag. Um, are, and you guys are still offering this program through COVID, or has it kind of been put on hold? No, no, we've been doing it. We wear our masks. Robbie, where's your mask? <laughs> masks on. And, um, you know, the good thing about oysters is we don't, uh, we're not sure if oysters can transmit the coronavirus. But, um, you know, when you plant oysters a lot, you don't really hang out with people very much. It's <laughs> really nice. Like you and the beach, uh, you know, so, I mean, it's not like a group you know, that you're hanging out with, you know, having drinks, talking and telling stories, you know, you're, you're out there planting oysters and it's usually raining, right, Shirley? And, um, you know, um, so we've been just going on with the whole thing. And, you know, we, um, we um, contact our members uh, through, uh, we tried doing the newspapers. We tried, um, you know, Thurston Talks website, which was awesome, which Shirley's neighbor, Mary, um runs or something i don't know owns and then um we we um uh we tried just doing direct mailings uh we tried going door to door um do going door to door is really good but it takes a lot of time and um people aren't used to having you come and knock on their door and talk about oysters but when you do you know they're always like flabbergasted or whatever the word is you know but um so we tried direct mailings and we have a lady named jerry um, she's awesome, Jerry Smith, and her and her husband, Bill, and they are like GIS masters. They used to work for the state or the county or something. So they figure out who lives on which shorelines and how high their bank is, and I don't know how they do all this stuff. And then we mail to those people. We'd love to get the post office to donate the stamps because it's expensive, man. We figured it out it costs like about 85 cents to mail one of those oyster letters out to somebody you know, so we're just, we're always trying to, if you guys have any brainstorms, like we're thinking maybe we try to get copy max to donate or whatever it's called office Depot or whatever to donate the printing or, you know, we're always trying to figure out cause we want to reach out to more people. You know, we've hit like every Bay around here and we want to get going up the Nisqually and cause we're really dedicated to this mission of um, cleaning up our waters. We're going to start trying to um, reproduce Oli's uh, Mike is going to help us. Mike, thank you so much uh, in how to approach these um, godlike um, forces in our society that write these permits and allow us to do things or not. So um, as Mike knows all about, so we're going to be talking about the WDFW plan, master plan, is that what you're calling it? The oyster plan? There's an oyster restoration plan. Yeah. So basically, you know, our goal is just to get people involved. So we just mail people. We say, hey, you want to plant some oysters? Um, we charge X amount of money per bag. We'll come and plant them for you. You can come and pick up, on, up at our house. You can plant your own bag. You can pick up your own oysters. We focus on reusing the gear. A lot of complaints we hear from people are, this oyster growing stuff puts a lot of trash out there in the ocean. Fish eat the trash. It kills fish. So we're like very listening to that and we want to stop that you know so every time we can think of a way to reuse this stuff and be more careful how we do it you know we're we're open to ideas one of the things that we're really stumbling over right now is we use rebar to stick down the bags and rebar as you know is susceptible to salt water corrosion and it only lasts maybe five to ten years so I can see Mike's got some gears turning in his brain there. What could we use besides no, rebar? I, could we use plastic rebar? Whoa. Maybe so. I hate plastic. <laughs> Everyone raise your hand. Oh, 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 oh
Well, I don't know. <laughs> we use like plastic rebar because it might last 50 because the bags are made of plastic. And to be honest with you, I'm still using bags that I got from some old timer down the road. I know they're 25 years old and they still grow oysters. Recycled, recycled plastic rebar, guys. <laughs> might be some, onto something there. I feel like we could grind them up and turn like the oyster shells into like a concrete rod that we could use. And then the little larvae can attach to the bars. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think this is great. Kidding. Yeah, Dan, Kidding. this is amazing. <laughs> I, I have, amazing one, more, I have one question. Do you guys, either of you have like a website with the, like a lot of the information that you've just talked about today that you can share that, that we can then share on our channels for people? Um, who are uh, getting, getting their own stack yeah. of posters. I'll, I'll type it into the I'll type it into the chat. Okay. So so Dan, I just put in the um, Olympia Oyster Restoration Plan. Um, uh, a link to it into the chat. Awesome. I'm typing um, in our Facebook page. And we are Surfrider is happy to to share these on our channels as long as we're not promoting introducing plastic rods into our net. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I agree, man. I agree. So I am going to add another link, which is the Puget Sound Restoration Fund Olympia Oyster Program. Um, they've got a great website. So that's that just restorationfund.org programs Olymp or Olympia Oysters. Um, they've got a great history, various results, lots of pictures talking about what they're doing shows their hatchery um, and there's videos and all sorts of great stuff. Great. Heck yeah. Awesome. Thanks guys. Yeah, cool. That's, I'm ready to plant oysters. I'll go out and help my mom. <laughs> right on. Well, Unless there are any last questions. Oh, um, I do have a question. Yeah, go for it. Oh, sorry. I don't think you can see me. Anyhow, my name is Christopher Gerber and I'm with Artists with Ecology. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a, it's a nonprofit group that does uh, art restoration pieces. Um, and I've been thinking for a while of, you know, kind of creating artificial oyster reefs. So kind of without the bag. Um, or without the bags, if we were just to dump shells in a pattern, right? Like to create a pattern along a shoreline that if you were flying above or when the tide goes down, a geometrical pattern goes up. Ideally, I think like a coastal salish basket pattern would be great. So to put down those oyster shells and then to seed those oyster shells um, could be ideally Olympia oysters if they, you know, if the water was clean enough to support them. But I think to start rebuilding and reintroducing those um, oyster beds or, or, or the reefs in particular, the reefs as a system, it's a very big part of the, you know, the Puget Sound region or you know, what was here. And I think can really help with shoreline restoration and preservation. So just for example, like down, um, you know, down in Olympia, um, by Swantown Marina, where the water comes, the, the McKinley Creek, I think, exits right there. There's a pipe, mm -hmm. right, that enters into the water. Are you familiar with that? Anyhow, you can see where tidal, the, the tide rising and sea level rise is already like eating into that sidewalk. It's already like, it's, it's obviously happening. So if we were to put in some artificial reefs, like just kind of go in there with a, a low bottom boat and dump these oyster shells in a pattern and then seed those oyster shells, we would start to reintroduce a reef. And so it's, it's not just reintroducing the oysters, it's reintroducing an entire habitat. Um, and I've seen this done in different places on the East Coast. Has anyone ever done anything like that around here? Is that a possibility? You know Christopher, that's a great idea. I think you have an awesome idea and I would love to be involved with that. We've done a lot of oyster uh, seeding attempts all around Olympia on some really crazy pieces of shoreline that you would never think would grow anything. And um, they, they grow fine, you know, especially the Pacifics. I mean, it'd be great. And I can grow Olympia oysters now. I could grow them in some really 
um, bizarre muck right in right down in the in the harbor. So as long yeah. as they're wet, they will grow there. They might not reproduce, as Mike knows, but um, I, I I'm really into doing that, and and I think we should do that. Let's let's go for it. There was a group about 20 years ago. Mike probably knows about them that planted uh, a a ton of oysters on um, the sandbar that's in front of Priest Point Park which is yeah. actually known as Clam Island or some other people have called it a more um, name that we can't say on the air. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, those oysters disappeared. No one knows what happened to them. I believe they were stolen, but I'm not going to say that on air. Hey, so, this will be okay. <laughs> so, Chris, I agree. I think that's an amazing idea. Um, I will warn you about one potential hurdle you're going to have to clear. Um, uh -huh. and, and that is, I just learned this a couple months ago, that if you want to put live oysters out in Puget Sound, all you have to do is have um, basically an okay from the, the Tideland owner, um, as well as a transfer permit from WDFW. Um, Okay. If you want to put shell out in Puget Sound, however, the Army Corps of Engineers views shell as the equivalent of fill. And so you have oh. an Army Corps of Engineers permit to put shell in Puget Sound, even if that is shell that naturally occurs on that beach. Um, the irony of that is not lost in me. Um, but it is, it's a bit of a process. I'm not saying it's one that you should avoid. Um, yeah. It, it, it can be a somewhat lengthy process, but I can, um, I can help advise a little bit in that process. Yeah, that would be great. I think one of the things that really inspired it was the, uh, just looking down the, so, you know, the oyster house down, right down there in the water, they've taken it just dumping their shells in the water, which I think is great. I think that is fantastic. And um, they're like, yeah, we haven't had any problem with dumping the shells. I'm like, well, that just really makes sense to, you know, because, so the big picture about returning these reefs is that, you know, as you know, we act, it actually kind of sweetens the water, like around those oyster shell reefs where you've got a bunch of dead oyster shells, the more acidic the water is, the more, the, the quicker those shells break down. And that calcium is released into the water for young oysters to build their, their shells from. So, and what's interesting is that it creates almost like an aura that just is centered around that pile of shells, right? Elsewhere, you know, it's, it doesn't, uh, the, the calcium just stays there, um, which, is, which makes sense, right? Like that's, that's how you get, you know, young oysters have that, that uh, ready calcium supply. And because we've been taking the shells out of the water, and taking those those uh, reefs out and introducing through these like bed type thing, we've kind of taken the the reef out of the the situation. But I think that ultimately it could really sweeten, quote unquote, and protect our waters by creating more calcium rich waters in a more in a more and more highly acidic base. Well, and I think the other thing, and this is where. I, I probably see the real value of this is that sort of public art um, could bring great awareness to what I would call the, the plight of the Olympia oyster or the plight of, of shellfish in the era of climate change. Um, yeah. And so I think that in and of itself has value. Um, and unfortunately, it would go under the heading of no good deed will go unpunished. Like if you're a restaurant throwing shells um, off your back deck, like no one's gonna pay attention and or care. But if you do a public installation using oyster shells, someone's gonna notice. Uh, yeah. I would say, I would say the oyster growers may be uh, an even better uh, audience for your idea because they generally own the tide lands. They have a ton of extra spent shells. And if they can get uh, PR and advertising out of making cool uh, native designs or things that are simultaneously promoting their industry and uh, 
and also, you know, sort of furthering this message of con conservation. I, I could see them being a lot, uh, I could see them being into the uh, way into that. When you start dealing with the city and the county and, uh, you know, you're talking about spending taxpayer money, which just gets uh, really uh, uh, very contentious very fast. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, just an idea, you know, Taylor shellfish companies like that, uh, maybe they, they, maybe they would, could really bite on a, an idea like this. I don't know. Yeah. I've, I've talked with uh, Chelsea farms and they were um, very, they warmed up to the idea. They really liked it. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and I've, I've talked with uh, um, Zeta at uh, the Port of Olympia, and uh, she's a little outnumbered right now, <laughs> but still sees that as a real possibility of, you know, like working with the Port of Olympia. There's also some restoration going in around the, uh, along West Bay, you know, that whole area where those big warehouses are. And I thought it would be great to do some, you know, decorative oyster shell designs along there and see what grows you know especially around the creek mouth that opens in there and, and stuff like that i think that would um it's amazing when you look this up and see how uh oysters have been used you know all around the country and all around the world and it made huge differences not not only just in the the cleanliness of the water but also again the um uh a lesser acidity in those in those areas I feel like that is a great costume for those of you still looking for a costume is you take Joe's black cloak cape and you just glue a bunch of Olympia oyster shells to it and be like, I'm a native reef. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tidelands. I'm Tidelands. Yeah. A lot of uh, farms, hobby farms, etc. Um, also use those oyster shells. They buy the <laughs> oyster shells for their uh, chickens and ducks and uh and uh geese and so forth so right. you know it's a natural calcium deal there so nice revenue stream <laughs> on. all right well thank you guys so much for such a lively discussion this has been amazing um i do want to respect everybody's time it's getting it's getting on there um, and so I don't want to take up too much more of y'all's evening, but thank you so much uh, to our presenters, Mike and Dan, for their amazing, kind of, you know, all the work you guys have been doing because it is hard work lugging heavy sacks of smelly oyster shells around. So we appreciate you spreading the gospel of what oysters can do for uh, our coastal communities and our Puget Sound. So um, yeah, just wanted to thank you guys all. We will try to post um, a recording of this presentation on our social media channels and our website and we'll include um, a lot of the links that you guys shared um, for more resources and try to get that information out to everybody so uh, stay tuned and uh, yeah and if you I think that's all I had to end with unless there are any uh, any last minute additions uh, that's so great that's thanks thank you yeah don't forget to vote ballots are due by <laughs> p.m. <laughs> on November 3rd. So, right on. Drop it in the Dropbox if you haven't already. Oh, yeah. Don't, it. <laughs> Don't freak you. out. Don't Thank you, everyone. Stay cool. Thank you. Bye, Thank guys. You. Have a good night. Thanks. See ya. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.